Thanks for joining us. A part of former President Trump's platform is his vow to stop illegal immigration. He pledges to deport millions of people and says it will be the largest deportation plan in history. He also says he will use the National Guard to arrest illegal immigrants and wants to end birthright citizenship. Paul, I'd like to ask, how will these policies affect communities nationwide when statistically 5% of U.S. homes have one or more occupants that are not U.S. citizens? Well, I think it all depends on how the non-U.S. citizen came into this country, whether they came in legally through the ports of entry or whether or not they streamed by the tens of thousands across a border that was not supposed to be open to them. And uh, I have traveled all across the world, and there is virtually no country that does not have borders. And the ones that have gone through in Europe now with uh, unlimited immigration are now springing back the other way to protect their borders and to protect their economies. Uh, there was a uh, headline last week uh, in uh, one of our daily circulation newspapers about the, uh, I think it was $18 billion that has been spent in New York State on migrant populations that have been shipped to New York or have come to New York. And we've seen it here in the town of Colony. My district has Wolf Road. Last Memorial Day weekend, all of a sudden, without any notice, New York City shipped 210 illegal immigrants that they welcomed as a sanctuary city and they sent them to Colony. And without exception, every immigrant family that had children, they shipped to the Shure Stay and all those children were educated at the cost of the North Colony school taxpayers. So every immigrant child that came to Albany County was paid for their education was paid for by the school taxpayers and property owners of North Colony, not even the whole town, but the whole concentration. So when they talk about every town becoming a border town, this is unsustainable. You cannot allow uh, two million people to walk across your border. Uh, people like to criticize, great talking point for the Democrats is, well, Trump wouldn't allow the bipartisan bill to pass. Well, what nobody likes to remember is the bipartisan bill said you could have up to 5,000 people a day walk across your, your border, and that's 1,850,000 people per year. And they said no. The entire Republican Senate and the entire Republican uh, House said no, we're not going to institutionalize or normalize two million people walking across the border. They, what that bill for the most part did was fund more judges to process people across the border. It did not do anything to limit people coming across the border. So there will be, a, under a Trump administration, there will be a response uh, to shutting down the border, making it like it was, when Trump was president, remain in Mexico, legal immigration, and uh, uh, there will be some uh, matter of relief uh, for uh, cities and municipalities across this country that local taxpayers are having to pick up this burden. Thank you. And Dr. Call, I'd like to ask your professional opinion on the former president's immigration plan. I think that this plays into a larger trend that we're seeing globally of populist leaders specifically focusing on issues like immigration. And we aren't seeing unprecedented numbers of migrants. There have been similar levels of migration when you look at actual percentages of population uh, that have been foreign born or that have come in from foreign countries. So this isn't something that the United States hasn't ever dealt with before in the past. So this is not something that is brand new to politicians of both parties. 
And I do think that the immigration policy that Trump has put forward uh, has addressed a lot of those kinds of concerns that have been evoked by this kind of threat framing that we have in the media specifically and through politicians of having uh, migrants as the other, as the threat in the situation, and therefore being needed to pre uh, protect American citizens. So this is something that political science literature has been looking at. And Donald Trump's policies, while they are a bit more extreme than many of the other populists that are also doing the same thing, uh, it's within the realm of what other populist leaders are doing globally. Thank you. And Dan, Vice President Harris specifically has put emphasis on ways that she would enforce border security and how she would crack down on drug smuggling. She's also put her support behind comprehensive immigration reform, but has not spoken on if she would continue the Biden administration's programs that have allowed more than a million migrants into the country. How would her presidency differ from um, the Biden administration, and how will that impact immigration into the U.S.? Sure. I will say that um, the Biden administration did take steps to curb um, a flow of immigration that came across the southern border. So I'd imagine the vice president um, would continue that in her administration as well. Um, but I do want to get back to the, the bipartisan border bill that the vice president said that she would sign. Um, Paul's right. The entire Republican Party did end up coming out against it. I uh, just failed to say when, and that was after... Uh, President Trump made the call to whip the votes against the bill. Um, I don't think anyone would uh, consider Oklahoma Senator James Lankford as some liberal on this issue. In fact, most people would consider him one of the most conservative members of the U.S. Senate. And that conservative member and several other conservative members, a majority that would have passed this bill and actually solved the problem, agreed on that number. Um, and it's not a number of people flowing in illegally. It's a number of people being processed through the southern border, which you pointed to um, as something that the bill would do as well. It would increase judges um, to kind of speed up the processing, to clear the backlog. We all often talk about the uh, uh, immigrants who came the right way. Um, you know, back when <laughs> my great-grandparents came, the right way was signing your name at Ellis Island, and you're off on your way. Um, if that was the right way now, uh, we wouldn't consider these people illegal immigrants. Um, and to the point about who's footing the bill, uh, let's not forget it wasn't New York City that started shipping immigrants up. It was the state of Texas and the state of Florida who abdicated their responsibility as border state, a responsibility that comes with billions upon billions of dollars in federal funding that we pay for in our federal taxes to deal with that problem. And instead, they said, oh, New York will treat them like human beings, so we'll just send them up to them. We'll just round these people up in buses and send them up to New York. We didn't get a cut of that money. Where's our money from Texas? Where's the billions of dollars in federal funding that goes to these border states no, but they don't want to solve the problem. They want to paint a picture of what Democrats are doing, and they want to paint a picture of a porous southern border when we have a, a northern border that doesn't get talked about a lot, and we have ports of entry in every city in America called airports that the vast majority of people who are here illegally got here in an airport. So we talk, and we conflate the conversation about immigration and immigration reform, and putting a pathway to citizenship on the table for the people who sustain our economy. If we go forward with mass deportations, not only will families be separated again like they were in the first Trump administration, but our national economy will crumble. If you don't like the high grocery prices now, just wait until Trump rounds up agricultural workers in mass and you can't get produce on your shelves. Thank you. It's definitely a conversation that needs to continue. 